Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today for today's BU Alumni online panel discussion. You're hired, a recruiter's roundtable to getting the job. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm a member of the alumni career engagement team uh, from the BU Alumni Association. Today's event is offered to our 385,000 alumni around the globe and, of course, our current students. And we appreciate everybody who's joined us today, some of you uh, logging in from some places very far away from our Boston campuses. Throughout your career, BU is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. And we aim to do this by providing everyone with access to a series of valuable programs, tools, and online communities. In addition to this webinar series, one of our most exciting resources is a free online community called BU Connects. If you haven't already signed up, I hope you'll take just five minutes after this presentation to log in and set up your free profile at buconnects.com. We have over 29,000 BU students and alumni already on BU Connects. It's the very best place to build your professional network with other terriers, join regional and special interest groups, become a mentor, find a mentor, or hopefully do both. Before I introduce our panel, just a couple housekeeping notes from me. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni and Friends website, which you can find at bu.edu slash alumni. Our panelists today are very eager to answer all of your questions. We hope to take a majority of this hour to get to those. Uh, and you're welcome to submit them throughout our hour using the Q&A function on Zoom. Just simply hover over your toolbar, select Q&A, uh, and we will uh, get to as many of those as we can. My job on the Alumni Association is to make sure that you all have a leg up in getting that next great job or finding fulfillment in the one that you already have. While everyone's experience out in the working world is certainly unique, there are definitely common themes that emerge when I'm talking with alumni who are out there looking to make a move. A majority of the common frustrations are just around the job search and hiring process itself. And we've assembled an experienced group of BU alumni recruiters and talent managers that we've invited here to help share their advice for standing out in the job market. So let's introduce them now. Um, Pat, you are first up on my screen. Do me a favor, go ahead and share just a little bit about your BU uh, experience as a student. You've worked at BU, uh, and then give everybody a little bit of background in your background in recruiting and talent management. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff, and, and thanks everyone for being here. And really excited to talk with you all today. It's, it's, it's uh, an honor and, and really excited to be included in this conversation. Uh, my name is Pat Nelson. I am a proud BU alumnus, as was all our panelists today, but um, I attended COM and, and graduated um, with a degree in PR in 2011, and then a, a math communication study degree, Master's of Science, um, later on during my time working at BU. But essentially, I have um, roughly eight years of experience in um, early career development and, and, and advising, five years working as director of career services at BU's College of Communication before working on the other side of the coin as a senior MBA recruiter at Wayfair and, um, and, and really gaining that incredible perspective um, from students as candidates and from that point of view. And after Wayfair, moved on to UMass Boston, uh, where my heart lies in higher education and, and back there as uh, the director of career services, specifically in their College of Management, working with they're business students. So thrilled to be back on the higher ed side of things. And I'm, I'm hoping um, I can provide uh, some unique perspectives from both angles. And I'm glad we can keep you connected to BU. Uh, Absolutely. As so thanks for being here, Pat. Abba, next up. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm Abba, pronounced like the band, correct? Um, I'm a native of Boston um, and a graduate of BU CAS uh, 2012. I had a great experience at um, I felt like I knew Boston um, as a local and then BU opened up like a whole new realm of not only Boston, but the world. So super excited to be here. Um, I currently head up director of people and culture at Omelette, which is an independent advertising and design agency based out of Los Angeles. Prior to that, I was in um, more of the tech startup world on the learning development side. So figuring out how best what people need um, to engage and learn and, and grow within their own careers. So excited to be here. Thanks, Ava. Molly. 
Hello, I'm Molly Richter. I'm a alum of Questroom. I got my MBA there in nonprofit management back in 2010. Uh, and so since then, I've been working in the nonprofit sector, uh, specifically in fundraising. So I graduated from Questroom and started working as a fundraiser and then decided that maybe that wasn't the, exactly the career trajectory that I wanted to be on um, and was fortunate to find a role uh, eight years ago at Partners Healthcare working as a recruiter for their central fundraising office across the system. Um, so the whole fundraising staff across the whole, what is now Mass General Brigham system is about over 500 individuals. Um, so I was recruiting across all of those jobs uh, for about five years. And then two and a half, almost three years ago, um, I pivoted to uh, specifically Mass General Hospitals Development Office and switched from purely recruitment to doing talent management for the 230 fundraising professionals that are at MGH specifically. Uh, and so my role now is overseeing, uh, in addition to recruitment, uh, also onboarding, um, performance evaluations, promotions, uh, you know, employee relations, employee engagement, offboarding, and, and everything in between. Awesome. Molly, thanks for being here. Mike. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Conway. I'm really excited to be here. I am a Sergeant 08 alum, um, studied human physiology. I grew up in New Jersey, um, so shout out to anybody on the call from New Jersey. Came up here um, and never left. Uh, so I have about 15 years in corporate recruiting experience. Um, I actually started as a high school anatomy and physiology teacher and made the natural progression into corporate recruiting. Um, but I've worked in agency. I worked in consumer goods at companies like Keurig, um, Sam Adams, uh, Shark Ninja, transitioned into wholesale distribution, and now I'm in biotech. So I am right now the head of talent and learning at Blue Rock Therapeutics which is a clinical stage biotech based here in Cambridge. So, you know, excited to help in any way we can. Thanks, Mike. And thanks all of you for being here. We've got such a nice diversity among the kind of things that you've all been doing, and I'm excited to dive into our, our conversation. So here's what we're going to do, folks. We've got a, I've got a few questions that we're going to ask to get thing, the, get the discussion started, and then we're going to really try to, to make sure we get to your questions. That's why we're here. We want to make sure that you get the information that you're looking for. So again, please put your questions into the Q&A at any time. I'm going to ask, we, we have a large crowd today, so I'm going to ask that you please try to keep it to questions only and not comments. The other thing is that I've actually set it up so that all of you, and I, I saw that some of you have already figured this out already, you can actually upvote the questions. So as, as we're going through, if you want to take a look at the questions that have come in, if there's one that you really want to hear the answer to, make sure you upvote that. And we're going to try to make sure we, um, we, we get to those uh, that are, are most popular. So um, let's do this. Uh, the first question I want to ask is if you could all just sort of share a little bit of the lay of the land in your industry or industries that you most recently worked in. What are you, what are your companies and organizations seeing as trends? Um, you know, there it, it we've all seen in the tech industry, there's this like cycle of hiring and then layoffs and hiring and layoffs. Are your companies in a hiring freeze? Are you actively hiring tons of people? Uh, and so I throw that out to all of you and whoever wants to answer first, please go ahead. Don't be shy. Shine Please, go ahead, Molly. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I feel like the name of the game in healthcare right now is systemization. Mm. Um, and so, you know, healthcare is a highly regulated industry, and you know, particularly in Massachusetts, is no exception to that. Um, and so the all healthcare entities are expected to keep, you know, very narrow um profit margins and also um have to be very mindful of how much costs are increasing year over year. And so as uh, so then what we're able to charge for things is not keeping up with um, what we, how we're able to get reimbursed. Um, it's just constantly looking at ways to um, 
you know, see where you can cut costs while also not, you know, taking away from your patient care, because at the end of the day, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, and so with consolidation, you know, there could be cost savings. Uh, and so, so, I mean, this is also not just a Massachusetts trend, but um, so many healthcare entities across the, the country, you know, are looking at um, consolidation. And so MGH um, and Brigham and Women's Hospital 30 years ago formed Partners Healthcare, which was rebranded to Mass General Brigham in April, 2020. There was something else going on at that time. Um, and now just a couple months ago, they announced that um, MGH and Brigham are going to fully clinically integrate. And so I told you that I was a recruiter for, you know, all the development offices across the whole system. Um, you know, we don't really know. We've, we've all been operating as, you know, 12 diff different development offices supporting our specific, you know, hospitals. But now, as, as they're saying, integration is happening. Um, you know, we're just, it's business as usual until we're told that it's not. Um, so, you know, so no, no hiring freezes. We're still actively recruiting, like everything's, you know, moving forward, but there's a lot of change, you know, on the horizon. Um, so that's, that's kind of the lay of the land, at least for my part of the world. Great. Thanks. I can, I can jump in there, you know, with regards to, to biotech, I think it's, it's pretty cyclical where, you know, there's booms, there's private equity money, the stock market's doing great, and everybody is really pushing, um, you know, hiring. I think we are at the kind of trough in that moment uh, right here. You know, when I graduated in 08, we were in the housing crisis and there were no jobs to be had. It was kind of job apocalypse and everybody just kind of went out to get what they could. Then, you know, money started pouring into the market and it became a candidate driven market. Then there was a trough and, you know, then there was a boom and now we're kind of in that trough again. So right now, I think it is pretty, pretty tough, you know, to, to Molly's point, it's all about, you know, corporate buzzwords. It's cost optimization, efficiency of your workforce. So, you know, as a candidate, you do need to appreciate that, you know, from a recruiting perspective, they are probably flooded with applicants of all varying expertises, really just trying to get put in the door, if you will, to the employer. You know, from a statistics perspective, I can tell you three years ago, where in biotech, it was a far more candidate driven market. Uh, we averaged about 30 applicants per role. Right now, we're averaging about 175 applicants per role. Um, so that's just kind of testament to how soft the market is, how many people are out there, and how, you know, important it is to, you know, figure out a way to stand out. How about, how about the creative industries? Yeah, uh, similar to, to Michael's point, I think clearly, um, I don't think advertising and design perhaps has as much as a, um, I don't want to say an impact, but a visible sort of ebb and flow that, that tech we often see in tech. Um, but it does certainly come in cycles. And I think what has happened specifically in advertising is, you know, maybe 10 years ago, seven years ago, we were primarily what one would consider an AOR, which are like agency of records, meaning a specific type of agency works on a specific client forever and ever, and they have a very long contract. And there was just a longevity to it. And now I think what we're seeing are just shorter and shorter commitments like that. So that we consider them project-based, um, which they can be quite long still, you know, one to two years, but they're not 10 or, you know, seven year long contracts. So that obviously, impl you know, implements our hiring practices because we're hiring for different types of projects on a shorter rate. Um, and so something I kind of consider when I'm talking to folks is to make sure that it, I call it like a candidate, like long, it's a long-term game. Like it might not work right now, but if you can stay in touch, if you can continue working, like it'll come back again. Um, so to try to stay at the forefront of that and, and have the patience to, to play the long game. Pat, you worked in tech for a while, and now you are helping students, grads, undergrads, navigate the, these same waters. Are there trends that you can point to that your your students are sharing with you that they're seeing in, in terms of like the job market? Absolutely. And I think what Abba just said is spot on. It is a long-term game from both directions on the employer side and the student side. And um, I think that in terms of trends that I'm sharing with my students, so they're mostly focused in consulting, tech, finance, um, pharma, and so on, and fintech. And 
I think the trends that are emerging are that the opportunities are there, you're seeing them, but they just continue to be extremely competitive. So in terms of the long-term game, anything that students and candidates can do to be ahead of it um, and make sure your documents are in an incredible place, make those strategic relationships at all of the companies you want to go to or are interested in so that when and if the job or internship happens, you're ready to go, you have your network ready to leverage already um, and, and so on. And really also, if, if you're not seeing the jobs that you, you want to be seeing, look for the industries and the companies first that you would be a good fit at. And as a result, you will no doubt find the jobs eventually, maybe immediately in some cases, but in most cases, they'll be there in a few months or so. But look for where you want to go and what will set you up to be successful long term. And don't just look at the opportunities because you'll find yourself firing off applications for things that you're not necessarily a great fit for, that your heart isn't completely set in. And, and that's just really a waste of time for everyone. So um, I, I, would, I would advise to do everything you can to be ready to go when the opportunities do happen. They're out there. Um, they're just fewer than before, and they're more competitive. So you want to do as much prep as possible to be in the right position when it's go time. Yeah. Pat, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. This, this is a little bit of an unfair question. And I actually would love to hear quickly from all of you if you have a take on this. But with, with your students, Pat, or even your like alumni that you've come in contact with, are you at all able to say that when a student gets serious about looking for that job until the time they actually land something, is there any kind of like, it takes six months, it could take six months to a year, um, and certainly that's going to depend on the industry and the, the person that's applying for these jobs. But are, are any of you able to say like, you know what, a job search on average takes this long? I think in terms of the recruiting perspective and what I've seen as a candidate while I've moved around, I feel like, yeah, three to six months is, is typical now. Things are taking more time based on the numbers that Michael mentioned earlier. Um, but what I always tell students, uh, so many students at BU, I Tell them, please do your best not to compare yourself to your classmates who, you know, the business students like over at Questrom, they may have jobs lined up already. And I talk with my comm students and they say, why don't I have a job yet? And it doesn't have to happen on day one. It doesn't have to happen on week one. It might take a couple months or so, maybe six. I don't know. It's different for everyone based on your background, your industry, where you're aiming to go, what geographies you're looking at. But what's most important is that you will, you need to know and believe that you're going to get a job at some point. And once you do, it's over, you're in it. And you'll look back and say, man, I wish I didn't worry so much for those four months out of um, college in my senior year summer. So um, it, it's variable. Yeah, sure. I'd be interested to hear what everybody else has to say on that. Yeah. And I was just gonna thinking maybe, maybe a better question for the other three of you is from the time your companies officially post a job until that position is actually closed. Is that maybe an easier question to say how long it takes to, to actually fill a position? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to, to Pat's point with more applicants, you are seeing hiring managers get something of like a Goldilocks syndrome where, yeah. you know, they want to see more people than they used to want to see just because they are looking for that quote unquote perfect fit, which as recruiters, we all know doesn't exist and candidates need to be kind of, patient in that it is going to take longer than normal. So I think, you know, to Pat's point, three to six months is depending on role, obviously, um, you know, depending on the seniority of the role, um, how readily available that skill set is, um, you know, if we're talking a wildly niche skill set, the company, uh, obviously dependent on business criticality might move very quickly to get that role filled. I think the caveat to throw out there, especially as it relates to candidates, that timeline is going to be very directed on your pre-work and how proactive you were on leveraging your network. So, you know, we're talking specifically about once you submit that application to the time that you have offer in hand or the time that you start, but you can wildly influence that process on, after, you know, leveraging and building those strong networks. So that when that right opportunity does come available, or even in a proactive sense, you know, someone seeks you out based off of the relationships that you have, like that'll obviously, you know, move the needle considerably. Yeah. 
Yeah. We already have some yeah. fantastic questions that have come in. Uh, some of them are, are already on our list. So I, I think we did a good job making sure we, we knew what to get ready for. Before we And you all have already touched on so many things that we could dive deeper into the nitty gritty on, on you know, Abba, you mentioned building relationships with the folk, with the hiring folks, the hiring team. I, I want to ask you more about that. But what do people misunderstand about the role of the recruiter, the hiring manager, whatever it might be. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about, um, you know, the folks that are engaging, folks that are re first reviewing resumes. What what do you all want to make sure that our, our audience understands about the role of specifically like the recruiter? I love that question. I think, um, as someone obviously within a people operations background, I think there are so many misconceptions about recruiting and HR in general, um, but specifically recruiters. I think what I always tell folks and I tell them up front on the first call is recruiters are there to advocate for you. So the best thing you can do is be transparent and honest and, and talk really openly and freely about what you need and what you're looking for. Um, they're not there just to sort of like go through a list of like, okay, yeah, you check this, you check that. Um, they're a super great resource for you. And I think what people forget too is like recruiters move around as well. I'm at this company now, but I'm not going to be there forever. So if we can maintain a relationship, a connection, if we feel like we have, you know, a transparent relationship, it's in my best interest to maintain a relationship with you as well. Um, and if I go to a different company, I'm going to still think about people, right? And I think people often forget that, um, that recruiters are, are can, can be a lifetime resource um, if you're using them correctly. That's great. Anybody else on sort of the misconceptions? Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with what Ava said. Um, but also, you know, I guess depending on like where you're working as a recruiter, you know, in my role, like my client, my responsibility is to my hiring managers, right? And to the company that I'm working for. And I think some people sometimes would get confused and think that I was like their recruiter, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that, that's a little bit, you know, I, one of my pet peeves is when somebody will reach out to me and they'll just say, hi, um, what job do you think is a good fit for me? And I'm like, I, I don't know who you are. Um, you know, let's have a conversation. I, I can't just read your resume and then distill like exactly like what job, you know, that's, that's not my role as a as a recruiter is to help you you know place the exact right position that you should be applying for like let's have a conversation and see also if it's um you know works both ways right um i think also as a recruiter i really tried to deliver my feedback on a candidate to the hiring manager in as neutral a way as possible because i felt like I wanted to accurately um, convey to the hiring manager this person's skill sets, their experience, like kind of how they handle the interview process and all of that. And then like leave some space for the hiring manager to then make um, inform an opinion, you know, on rather, whether then they thought this was somebody who they wanted to move forward into the interview phase. There are a lot of hiring managers out there who just want you to give them their, your opinion, just to say like, yes or no on this candidate. But, you know, I do really feel like our hiring managers are the experts on what they're looking for. And so that's also where I think some people also have this impression that recruiters are gatekeepers, you know, and really I, I felt like at least the way that I work, you know, I, I wanted the candidate to kind of speak for themselves. I, I love that. Uh, Molly, I was going to say that, that recruiters are not the gatekeepers. Like we are not the subject matter experts. You know, we, you know, to, to Abba's point, we should, we should be viewed as a partner. I, when I manage recruiting teams, I say that we are talent brokers and we start that relationship with the candidate and it's our job to find a mutually, you know, beneficial relationship with the hiring manager. I think the only thing I would add is that recruiters don't hire anybody. Like we are process managers after we do that initial screen. So, you know, it really is understanding that it's building that relationship, the candidate getting a window into who the employer is, and then really allowing that recruiter to help kind of usher you through the process. But that ultimate decision does come down to the hiring manager and the hiring team. Pat, anything to add? 
Yeah, in, obviously I bow to my um, colleagues on the call for all talent um, items only because I think I was at Wafer for a little under two years, but those two years were um, extremely involved. And I would, I would echo a lot of these sentiments in, in just that, you know, we're not hiring you, but we're not just a, you know, a stone to, to step on. Um, you want to maintain great relationships with the recruiters because they know your hiring managers intimately. They know how they work, um, depending on whether you're going for a singular role or a program like an internship program. Um, they may have much more of a role in terms of running interview debriefs and working with hiring managers as they all talk to each other and say, should we extend an offer to this one? Should we extend an offer to that one? And I've been on calls where I've been um, facilitating 70 to 100 interviewers and hiring managers as they talk through final offers to candidates. And, and so with that in mind, you just want to have a great relationship with your recruiter because as Mike said, they're, they're a, a partner or an advocate for you. We want you to get hired if we're seeing interest from our hiring managers. So, so all of you have talked about these relationships, and, and we're gonna right after this, we're gonna dive into to the audience questions. Audience, please make sure you take a look at the questions, upvote the ones that you want to get to because we're gonna do that right away. But for all of you, how? Molly, you even mentioned some of your pet peeves in terms of how people have tried to establish relationships with you or treated you in the process. What are the to do's? How how should people approach approach you? I'm going to ask like six questions all in a row. How should people approach you? Are 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 recruiters, folks in your with your similar positions, open to being contacted outside of a specific job application? What are the things that the candidates need to do? Best practices on their end to build those positive and hopefully lasting relationships with all of you. Reach out to me about a specific position. <laughs> That's like, I'm interested in this position. Here's why I'm interested in this position. Here's my resume. You know, um, I'd love to learn more. Can we have a conversation about this? Like, don't like get, fill in, I think, some of the guesswork for me. You know, that's that's very helpful. Be as specific uh, as possible. And I don't want to interrupt you. I'm going to keep asking more questions. How when somebody does that, you're open to it, but you're going to take a look at their experience, their LinkedIn profile and make a decision because you can't have that conversation with everybody that wants to talk to you. So you're going to do a, a brief evaluation of them and either decide, yes, I'm, I'm open to chat with you or are you just not going to write them back if they're not a, a qualified candidate? Okay, the only people that I don't respond to are the people <laughs> the people who reach out to me via LinkedIn and think that I'm recruiting for the whole hospital. Right. Those yeah. I just ignore because I'm like, I work in the fundraising office. I am not the person who's going to be able to help you. But if somebody reaches out to me about something that is within my like realm or tangentially related, then yes, I will respond to you. And yes, I'll do exactly what you just said, a little bit of due diligence. So I at least have an informed opinion about whether or not like, okay, yeah, this is the job that I think we should be talking about for you, or I can come to that conversation with some other opportunities in mind. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Anybody, anybody else on the best practices? How do you build those positive relationships? Um, for, for me, I think it's just understanding the game, right? Where it is a numbers game, uh, for our organization, we hired about 180 people last year. We had 22,000 applicants. It's impossible for us to kind of build that relationship with every single one of those people, but having those kind of periodic touch points, understanding that this is not a one and done interaction where there will be more roles that open up that are similar to the one that you applied for and kind of poking at, you know, do you have insight to what the workforce or hiring plan is going to be for that upcoming year? Like, when is a good time? So kind of putting, playing kind of the salesmanship role, of like, when's a good time to reach out to you? Is it next month or two yeah. months from now? And staying top of mind so that, you know, to, to circle all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, everyone's looking for efficiencies and ways to act, um, you know, or, or work smarter. Recruiters are no different. So having a well-qualified candidate, knowing that you're going to have a role open in a month, you can start to pre-socialize that resume. And ultimately, that'll impact your metrics as a recruiter. You'll look great. You'll get a person a job that really wanted it, you know, a few months ago, just based off of 
kind of po positioning themselves in a networking way that was, you know, kind of advantageous for both. Yeah, I definitely echo that. The idea of of just sort of like a consistent, non-pressured communication, if that makes sense. I think understanding, like we keep talking about this idea of relationship building and long-term and um, in reading the details, like, you know, if, if, if on, sometimes I'll post applications or, or um, a LinkedIn message looking for certain talent, it'll say, email me at, and I'll have an, it'll put my email address and people will reach out on LinkedIn instead. And I'm like, just, it's like really little things like that, but it makes a difference. I think when you're receiving 200, 300 of those, um, like who's following up in the way that you've asked them to. Um, and additionally, I love to, when people just check in, right. It's sort of like a oh, hey, I just wrapped this project. I wanted to share this. This is a really cool client of mine. Hope you're doing well. That's great. That's, I mean, that, I think that's the best way to maintain long-term relationships is, is a kind of a two-way street. And like Michael said, like, hey, when can I check in? When is good for you? Great. Yeah, I, I agree with everything. And, and I think, um, you know, it's a, a lot of times when we're messaging or reaching out to folks, Sometimes I see students communicating like they have leverage that they don't have and 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 demanding terms or or sometimes they'll drop a whole cover letter into a LinkedIn message and folks probably aren't going to stop while they're scrolling to lead that. So to Molly's point, specific position and making sure that you're a pretty good fit for it because you don't want to just reach out to somebody and have half the boxes checked. And for, for a lot of students, they know they have to do this strategic networking piece, reaching out and saying hi to recruiters is great. Um, I would advise that they spend the majority of your time doing that with alums to build informational conversations um, as, you know, recruiters are going through their process and, 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 and they're all in different forms and shapes and sizes. And it's great to put a face to the name and see that extra interest, but making sure we're messaging people the appropriate way short, concise, to the point, specific positions, and timely, timely communication and not constant, for sure. Yeah. I think right, well, yeah. let's die, let's die. Oh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, I like to call out the inherent awkwardness that is part of the job search. <laughs> so like, every, well, every recruiter knows why someone that they don't know is reaching out to them on LinkedIn, like, we can call it out. It doesn't have to be kind of a, a long story of like, hey, like, how's your day going? Like, you, you, you might be concerned, you might not, but like to, to Pat's point, like straight to the point, why are we interacting? And like, we, it starts transactionally, but then the relationship builds off of that initial ask. Yeah. Um, great questions for the audience. Kudos to all of you. Let's dive into some of those. Pat, you just mentioned people dropping an entire cover letter into a message. Our, our number two upvoted question, does anyone read cover letters or are they a total waste of time? I think, you know, I, I love to hear, I think there's a lot of different um, feedback from the, the three of you on this. I'm sure you all have different experiences. I think cover letters can be very valuable tools for students, depending on where they're coming from and where you're going. If you are making a career shift or you don't have as much experience or something, a, a cover letter is a place where you make your experience and your candidacy make sense to the recruiter and the company gives a little more insight into your ability to write, your personality. Um, you know, the resume is crucial. That's your technical checklist of the incredible things that you've done and presenting it to the company. And that's what we're looking at. But um, I, uh, a lot of folks in career services will say you should always put one in just, and if they read it, they don't. But um, it's another opportunity for you to also illustrate your passion about the company the role, the research, and, and things that might not just be immediately obvious on your one sheet of paper that lists your degree info and your career highlights. But um, different recruiters have different uses for them. So um, I'd be very interested to hear what you all think. To, to Pat's point, I say yes, but don't have it be a stock letter. So a mentor of mine once said that a resume is a marketing document that's an embellishment of everyone's successes with all their failures removed. So if you look at a resume, you have to think about it 
the way a recruiter would look at it. And ultimately, it's a career story. And if there are any holes in that story, any questions that come from some of the transitions in that story, that's what the cover letter is there to address. So, you know, to Pat's point, if it's a career transition, if there's a career gap, everyone knows that a lot of people went through gaps coming out of COVID, like that majority of recruiters are not going to hold that against you. Some will, but majority won't. It's a becoming more and more accepted across the organization but or across the industry, but you have to call that out. Like the if you look at something and say a recruiter might have a question about this, call it out in the cover letter. Additionally, do some research on the organization that you're applying to. Like, are they mission driven? Call out why that mission might speak to you in the cover letter. So again, it's a, just another opportunity to differentiate yourself from just another resume that came through without, you know, kind of the perceived thought of why the person actually wants to work there. I would agree with everything Mike said. And I usually say that fundraising is going to be the last profession that will let the cover letter die. So yeah. I'm, you know, surprised to hear that uh, other industries are looking at them as well. We, we've also been told we're not allowed to test candidates. And so essentially a cover letter is, uh, we look at it as like a writing example. Um, I have been telling my hiring managers, you should also assume that AI is writing any cover letter that you get these days. Um, so take it with a grain of salt, but yeah, we put in all, all of our, um, job descriptions say apply with a cover letter and a resume, but our system that we use doesn't allow us to make cover letter a required attachment. So, um, but I have most of the hiring managers I work with prioritize candidates that include a cover letter with our application. We're very similar, Molly, actually, we, the, the system we use it, it uh, will allow you to require it or not. I don't require it personally. Um, it's just preference, I suppose. And I think being in a creative industry, I do require a portfolio to be shared. So I tend to look there first, at, you know, but obviously there are roles that don't require a portfolio. But that being said, I do gravitate first towards the one that offer the most information. So if that happens to have a cover letter, then I'll probably look at it because it is there and why not? And it's just like more data on a candidate um, that being said, I don't, I don't necessarily feel like I need like three paragraphs long talking about every winding road that you took to get here. Um, I think people make so all sorts of different career decisions and I'm more than happy to hear about it, but it doesn't, at the end of the day, I think like many folks have echoed, if your resume can stand on its own based on experience, I'll look at that first. Um, but I do, I do love what you mentioned too about values though, and value sex. I think that's an interesting way to phrase it and, and think about it. Um, just another way to specifically relate to companies that that might make you stand out. Abby, you said you didn't need it to be three paragraphs long. Did you mean three pages? Three paragraphs doesn't <laughs> seem like that much to me. But really? To me, that's yeah. OK. No, I'm, I'm pretty I, I, I'm word salad uh, in a lot of my writing. So, OK, three paragraphs. I guess I consider you know what I really love. I'm really, really into right now is like a candidate summary. That's mm -hmm. a nice snippy way paragraph. You know, it gives me where you're at, what you're looking to do. There's quick, easy ways to fill in. Um, three paragraphs, I think, is quite long, quite frankly. But uh, this next question, the most popular one, absolutely related to this idea about cover letters, reviewing applications. And it's all about, you mentioned, you know, Molly, a lot of people are writing their cover letter using AI, but a lot of companies are also using AI to screen candidates before it's ever seen by a human. So the question is, how do I stop algorithms and recruiters from deeming me unqualified for jobs that executives later confess to me that I was actually quite well qualified for? I know that's a loaded one. We don't, our system uh, it's, does not use any kind of AI to do a screening. There is a, a human being who goes in and looks at every application. What I will say is our HR recruiters they're going in and looking at, at who meets like whatever is listed as the minimum qualifications. So you, that's the most important thing. Like in a job description, it'll say like, this is required and this is preferred. Our HR recruiters are looking to make sure you just have that, whatever's listed as this is required. They do stop actively screening candidates once a job has been posted for like a couple of weeks. So that so timing sometimes might play into it that once a couple of weeks, once a job's been posted for, you know, at least a couple of weeks, the recruiter will assume that the hiring manager has 
like the pool they want to look at and they won't go and look at new applicants unless the hiring manager proactively asks them to. So timing could be playing into that. Um, uh, yeah. And then I just want to echo like, again, what Mike said about like cover letters should be answering any questions that anybody has looking at your resume. Maybe it's that your resume isn't telling your whole story and then make sure your cover letter is answering all those questions because maybe an executive is saying like, oh, now that I have a conversation with you, I understand this better. And maybe the resume wasn't doing that on its own. Just a guess. So AI is like the industry buzzword right now. Um, I can tell you it is prohibitively expensive on the recruiting side and most recruiting budgets cannot support it. So outside of like the very large Fortune 500 organizations, odds are the recruiting teams are not utilizing AI for heat mapping or, you know, perceived fit. I think what you do need to be cognizant of, as we said earlier, re recruiters are not the subject matter experts for the technical components of the role. So you look at the job description, you, you do have to essentially mirror that job description from a requirements if you have those. I'm not saying be disingenuous, but those are the things that the recruiter is looking for at that initial pass of review before they reach out for a screen. Does that align? Fantastic. Then you can make the sell, um, you know, once you actually get on the phone or, or, or via Teams. I can say, um, you know, I, I left BU before AI took flight, really, and then got back to UMass Boston at a time where it's prevalent. And so I'm seeing students now who are very concerned about it that I haven't been seeing before. And they come to me and they say, you know, how do I beat the ATS system? What do I do? And how do I make sure that my resume is going to be seen? And one, the majority of these students have a lot of other things to worry about before we get to that point. And two, um, it's not about beating the system. You will drive yourself crazy looking for keywords to throw in your resume or quoting things in your cover letter. Yeah, sure. If, if there's some clear themes in a job description that you may not have spoken to as strongly as you should in your resume or cover letter, then go ahead and make some tweaks for that specific application. But the way you beat the ATS is by everything we've been discussing, making these strategic relationships with alumni or people who have worked in your space who can help to advocate for you when and if you do get involved in a process. I mean, more than half the game for an applicant, student or otherwise, is making sure that you can be assured that your application has been seen and viewed. If you've been seen and viewed and you know you don't get selected, that's just how it is. Tough luck. But more than half the battle is just making sure it's getting in right of the front people and we know that it's been viewed for our own peace of mind and our own strategies as applicants. And so there's other ways to be sure that if you think the company you're applying to is using all of these AI um, inputs into the ATS or whatever, um, there's other ways that you can stand out pre, um, pre interview. Uh, question from David at the end of online applications, they often ask questions about disabilities, race, sexual orientation. If, if a candidate opts to not answer those, will that be used against them in any way? No. Oh. All right. In our system, those answers are not connected to your, they're not visible to the recruiter or the hiring manager or anybody. And I think yeah. that they're, I think for us, you're required to ask some of those questions if you have certain like federal funding and things like that, but it's not visible um, to anybody involved in the hiring process. Yeah, I think people would be surprised. That's like, a that those are legal questions that are required to be asked within certain, uh, you know, applicant system. Um, but you don't even see those on the back end, really. You can't. Awesome. Okay. Um, here's one about uh, closing closing a job offer. Should I assume that an initial offer is always a low ball, something that I should always try to negotiate up? I'll say no. Um so it's going to depend on the organization, but most organizations are operating within a range. Um, 
it's a fair question towards the later part of the process, at least in my opinion, to ask about the compensation philosophy, right? Um, some organizations have a philosophy that they pay at the midpoint of the range, and that's just what you're going to get. So there's not a lot of room for negotiation, but an organization that says that will most likely come out at the 50th and say this is, or the 50th percent, and this is what you're going to get. Other organizations, you know, that are paying higher in the range might come a little bit lower. So I think it's just understanding the organization that you're interacting with and, you know, having that open, transparent conversation. You're not asking like, what's your budget for this role, but your compensation philosophy is a more gentle way of kind of getting to that uh, answer. Great. Um, bunch of folks asking about ageism. I'm 49. It's something that I'm already kind of concerned about if I were ever want to make a move. Uh, I'm, I'm realizing there's many of you out there older than 49. I'm not trying to take anything away from your question. But um, what can candidates do during the search and interview process to combat any inherent subliminal ageism that they feel like they're encountering during the process? I do feel like ageism, it's like, um, it, the way that I see it come across is, is in the, uh, you're overqualified, mm. like, right? Like, that's how I, I see it play out is that they'll say like, oh, this person's overqualified, you know, for a role. Because um, again, in the world of fundraising and philanthropy, we have a lot of career changers. So there are a lot of people who have like had a whole career somewhere else. And then they're they're thinking about like, what they want to do for, you know, um, the next part of their career. And they're really want to do something mission driven, or they want to do something they want to give back. And so they're, they're less focused on the title or the salary or things like that. And they want to do something mission driven. Um, but I think that, you know, so then it becomes really hard because then if you are a career changer, you're then that can mean like starting over in a career and so a lot of our like entry points you know are highly administrative um and so i think like there's just a conversation to be had about like making sure because sometimes people say i don't care about the title i'll do whatever but then when you're like okay great and we're gonna pay you you know this amount of money to do that job then they're like oh, well, you know, it, it's a little bit of a harder conversation. So I think having a whole conversation about what it means, you know, to, to start over in a career and making sure that that's something that everybody feels good about. And as long as the individual is like really, um, you know, kind of has their eyes open about what they'd be getting into, it's like starting over. Um, then I think it can, and in a, and so I think it can be a really um, successful, you know, path. But that, anyways, that's how I see that play out most commonly um, in my world. So I see it kind of in two points of intercept. Uh, one, at the initial kind of application, um, you know, in a candidate, or sorry, in an employer-driven market where there are a ton of candidates, you know, you will see somebody dropping down two or three levels. And your concern there from a recruiting perspective, so folks understand kind of recruiting metrics, sometimes recruiters are held to account for first year attrition, right? If you hire somebody and then they leave within the first year. So you're concerned, is this person simply looking for a job and then they can continue to look when they find a level that's more appropriate. So that is something to call out in the cover letter where if you have a specific skill that you really like, you've you've tried the things elsewhere, you've tried the vice president role, you don't want to deal with the bureaucracy, you want to come in in the weeds and nail X skill, call that out specifically. Once you get to the hiring manager stage, I think what folks don't realize is that a lot of managers don't go through robust manager training and it is really intimidating to manage someone that has more experience than you do because you're not confident in your own managerial abilities. This person might come in and management might see them more fit for your role. So I think it's being that transparent that 
I'm not here to take anybody's job. I'm here because I really love this body of work that I get to do at this organization. And what you don't have to worry about is teaching me office etiquette and teaching me how to use X, Y, Z. I know those things. I can come in and operate at a very high level very quickly. I think that's a great point. And it's not even sometimes I think calling out, like this is a perfect example of when I think a cover letter or a conversation initial would be super helpful to provide context because sometimes it's not even a career change. I mean, we get a lot of folks that have decided for whatever reason or not, it's, it's almost like um, a lifestyle change. And I think we saw a lot of that post the great resignation when people were really examining, what are they doing? How are they spending their time? You know, I have a young son. I don't wanna manage a team of five anymore. I wanna be an individual contributor. Um, and I'm willing to take a pay cut to do that, to, to create more of a work-life balance. And I'm always happy to hear those things and hear about what, yeah, people, people are free to take whatever types of jobs they need at any point in their life. And I always say that, like, it's not just a one way up. It's, it's a up and down depending on where you are in your life and what you need. Someone once said to me that it's um, not the career ladder, it's the career monkey bars. Yeah. It really stayed with me. Uh, Molly and, and Michael, you both, Mike, you both mentioned the situation where somebody might be overqualified for a job really quickly. Is, should somebody ever hide experience? extensive experience on their resume in order to, to get their foot in the door for a position that they might be overqualified for. I can see that really backfiring in the long run, but yeah, but I, people I, are, people are needing jobs, right? I have a strong opinion about this, Molly. Do you want to go first? No, I'm just, I'm not, well, if somebody's hiding experience, I wouldn't know it. I'm like, I'm just, I'm not sure I've ever seen that before. So no, go ahead. No, I, I think for me, like it's, it's integrity, right? Like if you have to kind of, hide or fake any capacity of your experience or your potential for an employer to consider you probably don't want to work for that employer like remembering that this is has to be a mutually beneficial relationship so you don't want to start off of you know hiding something and it speaks exactly to what you said about like if there's one thing that you really like doing you don't want to be at the managerial level you want to get in the weeds that that's the way to do it in the cover letter um a lot of questions about just like changing industries for all of you, are candidates for positions, are you are you regularly considering folks that might be non-traditional? I mean, you've all talked about the in intense competition. Are you hiring folks that are making a total that some, seems like a massive change from one industry to another? Molly, you're nodding yes. I'm trying not to always be the first one to speak. <laughs> all right. I'm really not shy. Yes, like I said, fundraising is full of people who are like, this is their second career. What I have noticed an uptick recently is a lot of people who uh, we've heard of several teachers recently are people in the education space. And like, yeah, I think COVID and remote school <laughs> did a number on people. Mm -hmm. And there are definitely a lot of people who are like, I need a break from the classroom. So we've, we've seen... Um, I've seen a number of, of individuals coming from that space, but yeah, we're, we're full of career changers. Aren't, I mean, healthcare, like academic medical center philanthropy is a pretty small talent pool. Um, and so, yeah, we're always, I'm, and um, it's a pretty small talent pool and a largely homogenous talent pool. And so in order to have more, um, you know, diversity, which, you know, uh, is wonderful for a lot of reasons. You know, I really encourage our hiring managers to look, you know, outside of, you know, just who's working at, you know, Dana-Farber or the other academic medical center down the street. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Molly. And I think the one call out there, and it circles back to the fact that recruiters aren't the ones hiring people, is it is going to depend on the hiring manager and how progressive they think about diversity of thought, uh, applicability of industry to industry, and ultimately the role itself, how technical is the role. Um, so it's not a wildly uplifting answer, but I think it does depend on that hiring manager if they're open to you know looking outside of industry. Mm -hmm. All right, we have 32 open questions. I apologize. Um, we are not going to get to all of them in the four minutes we have remaining. But um, let's try to take at least a few more. If any of you have a hard stop at, at the end of the hour and need to go, I totally understand. But let's let's try to let, let's do three more. A lot of people upvoted a question about just standing out during the interview process. If you could all just sort of briefly comment on what are what are what are the interview specific behaviors 
things that you're looking for that you maybe see are are the ones that are helping people be the successful candidate once you get to the interview process? It's got to be a lot about soft skills, right? Yeah, I, I think if I, my first and foremost always is like an authenticity in mm -hmm. understanding that I just want to know truly what you like to do, what you want to do, what challenges you. I think sometimes people feel very like, I need to be the most buttoned up version of myself in an interview, which of course, yes, you should be professional and maintain boundaries and whatnot. But at the same time, um, I want to know like what you're still working on. I mean, I really say this specifically for folks that are on the more junior level of their career or transitioning into certain different types of career. It, it doesn't make any sense if you come into an interview and you say like, no, I'm so good A plus at this, this, and this, and this, and that's all it's, I want to know really what you want to work on this year. And because if we can even offer that challenge to you, um, and this goes back to the idea of standing out for me is feeling like we're also being interviewed. I want to make sure that we're not only a fit for you, but you know, you're a fit for us, but we're a fit for you. Um, and feeling like that, that's a two-way street. Thank you, emails. Never mm -hmm. underestimate the power of a thank you. Yeah. And don't worry when people don't get back to them. That's like thanking you for a thank you. You know, um, we read them and we appreciate them and we're remembering them. But I would say, um, you know, being personable, being authentic. Um, as I said earlier, when applying more than half the battle is like making sure you're getting seen one way or the other. When you get to interview, I think more than half the battle is, do we want to work with this person? Would it be a good culture fit for the team? Um, and if there's any um, boxes unchecked in their experience, then more often than not, companies will give you the support to overcome the training that you might need in some minor areas that you are deficient. I mean, no one goes into any job knowing everything and no one's a perfect candidate for anything. But I think eye contact, just being yourself, obviously you get to interview and that's when the nerves kick in. But anything you can do to be, as, as Abba said, the authentic version of yourself and be professional when answering the strategic interview questions, when there's room to be lighthearted, do so. Um, but you're being evaluated as a potential coworker just as much as somebody who can um, execute the responsibilities of the role. Right at the beginning, we started talking about building relationships. Um, and one thing that comes up a lot, we've got a bunch of people up about this question is how, how do you find the right person to contact at an organization? Uh, and I'm going to ask this either like if there's a specific position that you're interested in or you're just really interested in working in that company in some capacity. What advice do you have to share with folks about how to go about finding the right person to reach out to? The Uconnect is a good place to start. Thank you very much. I was just about to say that as we were stalling for, for all of you to answer. But you Connects is a great place to find folks that work inside of companies or industries that you might be interested in. But how about specifically, like, if, if you're looking to reach out to somebody on the HR team about something that you, you know, you put your application in online for something, haven't heard from anybody, and you want to follow up, how do you try to narrow down the right person to contact? I, I, I know it's an art and not a science, right? Hmm. I think doing everything you can to, if you're looking at the company, start with alumni because those are, that's a you know a soft touch there, it's easy. But in terms of finding the hiring manager or the recruiters, use those keywords in your filters on LinkedIn. Um, if you can pinpoint what a company is using as language internally for their titles, so HR can be one thing at one company. It can be four different things at another company. Talent recruiting all goes up to HR in a lot of companies, some companies it's very separate. So if you have alums or other relationships, they can help advise you maybe who you might want to be looking for um, and using those words, recruiter, talent acquisition, human resources in your title filters, maybe it will give you a good sense. It's not always easy. In my experience, I think it's either, yes, that is the exact person that I need to talk to or I have no clue. 
But a lot of times on LinkedIn, it'll show who posted the role. Um, so you can connect with that person. A lot of times in the job description, it'll say who the role is reporting to. You could do a search on what that title is and that person can come up. Um, you know, to, to Pat's point, you know, warm leads are worth their weight in gold. So who are your second degree connections? Who can, you know, get you in contact with the people that you, you want to talk to? Um, I think an important call out here is that average benchmark is between 15 to 20 percent of hires should be coming from referrals right and that's considered healthy across um, you know most industries so people in the company you're trying to work for are incentivized to give candidates to the recruiters to, to help hire so it doesn't have to be through the hr team specifically that you build those relationships but it can be you know tertiary secondary folks that are just interacting with the role that you want to work in, that if you build a relationship there, that could be the in that you need, um, you know, to get in front of the decision makers. We're jumping back a little bit. We talked a lot about cover letters, resumes, and applicant tracking systems, you know, the way that candidates are screened. Um, could, is anybody, and Abba, this might actually be most relevant for you. Um, are there specific resume formats or structure that folks should avoid? My experience is that, uh, particularly even with the BU hiring system, if you set, if you try to submit a really like creative outside of the box resume, the tracking system might miss some of the data in there just because of the way that you've structured it. So a lot of the advice is like keep keep your resume actually quite simple as opposed to again, in your industry, having this really like graphically designed, interesting looking one. Any comments on that? Yeah, ours is a bit different. My really only big pet peeve is receiving them as like Word documents because I don't have Word. I can't open it. It gets scrambled. Um, just PDF everything, please. Um, because the applicant tracking systems will include a PDF. And there I can see your beautiful work. And if it's graphic, if it's not, it's less important to me, quite frankly, if you're a creative, you have likely have a portfolio that we're looking at anyway. Um, but sure, they're nice to see. Um, but yes, I, I think PDF is probably always the way to go. Another pet peeve of mine is the functional resume. Um, because I, I also see this from people who are trying to like change, you know, change industries. Uh I, I need to understand like the timeline of your career so that I can then talk to that, talk to a hiring manager about you. Because if you have a functional resume, but you've been working for the last 30 years, I have no idea if the things that you are referencing are something that you did yesterday or something you did 30 years ago. And so just chronological resumes, please. All right, last question. Thank you all for your extra time. Um, how accurate... This might be more on the talent management side than the talent acquisition side, but how accurate are public salary databases like Glassdoor? Do recruiters use the same salary references as we do, or are there other places that talent managers, compensation analysts are seeking out data for positions, industries that only like, you know, HR professionals have access to? Does that make sense? So I have very strong opinions on Glassdoor. I don't know if anybody on the call is from Glassdoor, so I'll keep them to myself. Uh, but it is very subjective. Um, they're directionally accurate. Sometimes they're not. Um, pay transparency laws are kind of changing the game there um, a lot where, you know, you'll the for the employers that play nice um with regards to the laws um it does give you a really good direction of what folks are offering but to answer the question you know compensation has memberships to very specific um compensation data um so it is not apples to apples to what you're seeing in glassdoor and i wouldn't put a ton of weight into the ranges that you're seeing that's that's my personal experience i'd agree with that great i think <laughs> Thank you all for going over time. I'm so sorry to all of you that asked great questions that we're not going to get to. I think all of you might actually be on BU Connects. And so if folks have burning questions, let me ask for all of you, are, are you willing to be contacted for additional questions and continued conversation? Or is now not a good time? 
but maybe I won't let you answer that. We'll just say, hey, you could probably find these folks on LinkedIn and BU Connects. And so um, maybe reach out to them if uh, if you've got that burning question that we didn't get to. Um, you all did an amazing job. This was a real education for me. I, I And you just knocked the park out with some of your advice based on my experience over the last year. So, so Pat, Abba, Mike, Molly, thank you so much for doing this. On behalf of the whole Alumni Association, we really appreciate what you've done today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our audience for tuning in from all over the world. Thanks so much for being here. I specifically want to thank those of you. Molly, you'll appreciate this. I want to thank those of you that have donated to BU in the past. You help keep our, our work going. So thank you very much. I hope you all think about joining us for one of our future career events. Our next career webinar is coming up Thursday, June 20th. We're going to have a session called Building Your Leadership Credentials Through the Art of Cross-Functional Management. So for a lot of you folks that are thinking about making industry changes, maybe Cross-functional management might be something to, to add to your resume. You can sign up for that webinar on our website now at bu.edu slash alumni. Uh, and I hope you'll all just continue to keep an eye on the calendar, the emails we send you about the events that are coming up. Um, thank you all. Again, panel, fantastic job. Hope everybody has a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Everybody. Bye.